My dear fellow clergymen, we have waited more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep at a horse and buggy pace toward getting a cup of coffee at the lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and your fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kick your black brothers and sisters, when you have seen the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you have suddenly found your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that was just advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see the ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John. Your wife and mother are never given the respected title, Mrs. You are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at a tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with the inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern, one may ask. How can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation. Because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustices and shameful humiliation. And yet, out of the bottomless vitality, they continued to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we face now surely will fail. 
we will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Before closing, I feel impelled to mention one other point in your statement that has troubled me profoundly. You warmly commended the Birmingham police force for, for keeping order and preventing violence. I doubt that you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen this dog sinking their teeth into unarmed, non-violent Negroes. I doubt that you would so quickly commend the policemen if you were to observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes here in the city jail. It is true that the police have exercised a degree of discipline in handling the demonstrators. In this sense, they have conducted themselves rather non-violently in public. But for what purpose? To preserve the evil system of segregation. Over the past few years, I have constantly preached that nonviolence demands that the means we must be as pure to seek pure ends. I have tried to make clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends, but now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or perhaps even more so, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you. Not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in, in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace, and brotherhood, Martin Luther King Jr.